the first of four videos on the socialization role of education. Uh, and we're using the story of Indigenous peoples as a case study. This video, this first video, will set the context for our discussion. So we'll be talking a little bit in each of the four videos, a little bit about socialization, pre-contact, early contact, and then uh, more modern schools. Now, French philosopher uh, Michel Foucault argues that schools in general were a method of enclosing children for the purpose of disciplining or socializing them. These institutions were more insidious and effective than things like prisons because they were more discreet. They operated under the guise of helping and not punishing. Now, throughout the 17th and 18th century uh, Europe, the monastic model of schooling was gradually imposed and the boarding schools came to be seen as the most perfect, if not the most frequent, educational regime. Now, Foucault argues that disciplinary spaces need to be organized such that the uncontrolled disappearance of individuals can be eliminated and mixing or fraternization among inmates or students can be controlled. So the architecture of such institutions actually plays a role in this control of students. The spaces have to meet the need for things like supervision to control the dangerous, in quotation marks, dangerous communications, as well as creating a useful space. Now, Foucault notes that discipline should be a combination of rewards and punishments. So we can, we can question how does this apply to schools for Native children or Indigenous children? It seems very clear that as an experiment in social engineering, these residential schools were an extreme form of disciplining Indigenous children in order to, quote, kill the Indian in the child and make them into civilized, quote unquote, Christians. Now, Native peoples have been in North America for tens of thousands of years. So Indigenous peoples have been educating themselves, their communities, and their nations since time immemorial. They had a natural education system that followed the evolutionary complexities of cultural philosophy, social organization, and environmental orders. Education begins at birth and continues through one's entire life. Individuals were educated by their families, by their clan relatives, and community members. So they were taught according to their role as a contributor to society. They received further teachings from the spiritual realm in the form of dreams, visions, and ceremonies. So the, the education system, if you can call it that, was rooted in the culture. It was maintained in the communities and it was communicated through language. Now, it's important to note that with so many different Indigenous groups spread across North America, what this means is that there's not one single history of Native education. Now, this map shows um, a depiction of cultural areas of more than 500 tribes of North America that existed before first contact. So how do we learn about the history of Indigenous peoples from these very early periods? And we use a variety of documents such as this painting. Um, so paintings from uh, first contact, but also things like storytelling and pictographs. Now, North American stories are as varied as the trees on the earth, um, as one person put it. And yet there are very many common themes. themes. Uh, whether they're told by the Inuit um, in Alaska or the Seminole in Florida. We have traditional stories that are based on honoring all life, especially plants and the plants and animals that we depend on for our survival, as well as our human ancestors. Now, the Indigenous storytelling is rooted in the earth. Um, years upon years of a kinship with the land, life, water, and sky have produced a variety of narratives about intimate connections to the earth. Um, we find legends and history, poems and maps, the teachings of spirit mentors, instructions for ceremony and ritual, observations of worlds and storehouses of ecological knowledge, and so on. Stories often live in many dimensions um, with meanings that reach from the everyday to the divine. And there are stories in view places with the power to teach, with the power to heal and to reflect. 
So stories um, are possessed with such power that they have survived for de generations despite attempts at repression and assimilation. Now, most uh, stories tend to talk about living beings within a specific tribe's homeland. So the raven of the Pacific Northwest, the coyote from the desert, the buffalo of the plains, the beaver of the eastern woodlands, and so on. And stories explain why and how certain local plants and animals came to be, such as um, stories, there's a lesson about why rabbits have such long ears, for example. Other stories will explain ceremony and ritual. Prayers, songs, and dances are all also types of stories which can be offered to honor the earth. Um, some native songs are sung in great cycles and contain over a hundred songs for a spe specific ritual. One of the most important common themes among uh, these stories are creation stories, which are universal among all cultures. Native creation stories explain how life began on earth and how a particular tribal nation came to be. They talk about the spiritual and mystical origins and so on. And so we can look at all of these kinds of um, documents and uh, information and ideas passed down through the ages. Um, some of the early white people that came to North America captured uh, some of the lives, some details about the lives of Indigenous peoples uh, when they arrived. And so this image on the screen is one example of this. And if you note the tobacco pipe, it's actually in the woman's uh, mouth over here. Um, and it's the first known image of a Micmac keeled pipe. The drawing of the baby carrier is actually quite accurate. It's an ethnographic detail to which none of the copyists, um, other than uh, a few like this one, really paid sufficient attention to. And we can see there's a couple animals in there. There's two animals um, are a distinctive breed of Micmac dog with sharp pointed ears. There's one in the bottom uh, corner there. They're sometimes mistaken for foxes and other paintings of Micmac camp. So that would be an example of how we learn about um, what life was like. I mentioned about petroglyphs or pictographs. Um, this pe petroglyph or rock carving was cut using stone tools. Um, they think it's predating the introduction of European made metal tools beginning about 1500. So it's in this case, it's one of the um, earliest surviving human or humanoid figures of or by a Micmac. Um, the eight pointed star occurs in Micmac hieroglyphic writing as a symbol for the sun. And the knob crosses occur elsewhere as part of the hieroglyph for, for star as well. If you've never been, um, the Petroglyphs Provincial Park, which is northeast of Peterborough, has some lovely examples of petroglyphs um, relatively nearby. Now, first contact in North America um, or in Canada, what is now Canada, first occurred in the early to mid 1600s. Um, during this early period, education, quote unquote, according to the Europeans, was focused on the Bible and saving the immortal souls of the natives. And you can see in the early to mid 1600s, um, the French were attempting to civilize native peoples by conversion to Christianity and cultural assimilation. Uh, we have the Roman Catholic missionaries establishing the first schools for native children. But it's important to note that the French truly are relying on Indigenous peoples as military allies throughout the occupation of New France. Um, in 1660, the French begin to abandon a policy of cultural assimilation, but the conversion activities do continue. When the British took over control of what was known as New France, Indigenous peoples acquired a new political master whose language was different, but the messages are still the same. Um, although those in authority now spoke English instead of French, there continues to be an impetus to colonize um, uh, the country. So English speaking authorities, fur traders, missionaries, and so on, um, hope to accomplish peace and prosperity of British North America by subduing, by negotiating with, and Christianizing the Indian or indigenous population. 
The chief priorities of the crown of Britain in the late 18th and early 19th century were in fact military and economic. During the American Revolution and the War of 1812, Native alliances played an important strategic role. The fur trade um, also relied heavily on Indigenous peoples, on the knowledge and expertise of Indigenous peoples. As long as the Natives supported these important activities, the government devoted very little attention to the matter of Indigenous culture and education, and this leaves the field wide open to missionaries, both Catholic and Protestant, who continue in their quest to quote unquote, save native souls. However, as the threat of war starts to recede, um, the future of Aboriginal communities um, takes on some uh, new meaning. So we have the threat of war receding. At the same time, we also have the fur trade beginning to decline and we have an increase in white settlements into indigenous areas. With the majority of Indigenous lands being sold or surrendered to the British in exchange for stuff, material things, the Natives were faced with uncertainty, ill health, and economic insecurity. The response in Upper Canada, which was later copied in other provinces, was to move uh, Indigenous peoples to reserves and to attempt to educate them in day schools. So not boarding schools or residential schools. These were day schools where the kids would only go for the day, run by the churches. At those schools, they were to be taught the skills that were supposed to help them assimilate into a non-Native world. To streamline the process, uh, responsibility for Indigenous affairs was shifted from the military to civilian authorities in about 1830. Now, as you're aware, efforts to, quote unquote, educate indigenous peoples were rarely successful and resulted in much abuse, both physical and economic. In 1858, um, the Civilization of Indian Tribes Act expressly makes assimilation of native peoples its goal. And it declares that Indians who are, quote, sufficiently advanced education wise or capable of managing their own affairs were to be enfranchised. So they were um, to have the right to vote and to be part of the, the white community and not uh, treated as, an, as, as part of the Indian people. Now in 1858 as well, there was this uh, Management of Indian Lands and Property Act, which declares the commissioner of Crown Lands to be the chief superintendent of Indian affairs. And this person has the power to do what he wants with the lands that's reserved for the Indigenous peoples um, when they release them or surrender them. And those two acts are important later on. So by the 19th century, education for First Nations peoples was largely the result of an unequal partnership between three groups. And each of these three groups or partners had different objectives. Who are these three groups? Well, we first is, of course, the government. The government views education as part of the effort to assimilate Indigenous peoples culturally and to teach them alternative schools, such as agriculture. Uh, uh, that's alternative skills, such as agriculture. The second group are the churches. Uh, for the churches, who were primary Catholic, Anglican, or Methodist, the ability to read and write in one of the European language is essential to conversion and to be able to live as a practicing Christian. And then, of course, the third group are the Indigenous peoples themselves, um, who, in fact, wanted to acquire the knowledge that would allow them to survive and thrive at a time when literate Euro Europeans were becoming dominant. So Indigenous peoples clearly wanted the learning. But what they didn't want was the assimilationist efforts that came with the government and church officials. And that's the important distinction here. Throughout the 19th century, the relationship between Indigenous peoples, the military and the government changes quite a bit. Before 1830, the relationship between indige the Indigenous peoples and the British was one based on a military alliance. And it was an alliance between nations. There was a sense that Indigenous peoples were essential in order for the British Army to succeed in Canada, or what becomes Canada. As a result, the men who dealt with the Indigenous peoples acted quite diplomatically for the most part. 
However, as the 19th century progresses, um, Indigenous peoples quickly become less valued for their cultural attributes. Birds start running out. Um, the terrain and new military techniques were being mastered. They were, um, the British and, uh, were becoming familiar with how to survive on the land. And the overseas governments start to become more concerned with setting up settlements. So the Indian Acts of 1876 and of 1880 makes clear that the self-government for Indigenous peoples was to be abolished and finance and all social services, including education, were to be placed under federal control. So lands that were given to Indigenous people were to be managed on their behalf until they were, quote unquote, civilized enough to govern themselves. One of the key uh, people that was involved in this um, part of the story is Sir James Kemp. Um, so once responsibility for relations with uh, the Indigenous people shifted from military to civilian officials, the relationship changed. According to James Kemp, who was writing in 1829, the new approach was based on the official view that, quote, the most effectual means of ameliorating or improving the conditions of Indians, of promoting the religious improvement in education, and of eventually relieving His Majesty's government from the expense of the Indian Department are, first, to collect the Indians in considerable numbers and to settle them in villages with due portion of land for their cultivation and support. Second, to make such provision for the religious improvement, education, and instruction in husbandry, uh, which is agriculture, as circumstances may from time to time require. And third, to afford such assistance in building their houses, rations, and in procuring such seed and agricultural implements as may be necessary, commuting where practical, a portion of their presents or gifts for the latter. So that sets the context of um, how Indigenous peoples were treated and where they started from when it came time for um, education systems to be more formally implemented. I'm going to pause here for um, and and just to separate out the uh, the videos so they're not too long. So stay tuned for the next video. <laughs> 